Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs, the IIEA, in Dublin. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. We're delighted to be joined today by Avilo Calfin, Executive Director of Eurofound, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak with us. Eurofound is, of course, based here in Dublin. Avila will speak about living and working in an era of disruption, drawing on insights and findings from what I think is the fifth round of this excellent survey, uh, which actually completed as recently as May 2022. So it's based on responses, recent responses from over 200,000 people. So this up-to-date data will give valuable insights into how living and working conditions have changed and uh, will reflect on key challenges for policymakers, as we will hear. Mr. Calvin will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to questions and answers with you, our audience. As always, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we'll come to as many of them as possible once Ivilo has finished his presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now very briefly introduce Avilo before handing the floor over to him. So Avilo Calfin joined Eurofound as Executive Director on the 1st of June 2021. So congratulations on your first anniversary plus a month, Avilo. He was previously the Director of the Economics and International Relations Institute in Sofia. And prior to this, Mr. Calfin served on two occasions as Bulgaria's Deputy Prime Minister, 2005-2009 and 2014-2016, as well as Minister of Foreign Affairs, 2005-2009, and Minister of Labour and Social Policy from 2014-2016. Avalo, it's a great pleasure, and I hand you the floor for 20 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Barry, and uh, I will start by thanking uh, IIEA for the invitation. I mean, to be part of this uh, uh, excellent line of speakers uh, in the webinars of IEA is, uh, is a honor for me. And thank you very much uh, for all the uh, all those that uh, spare some of uh, their time uh, to watch our webinar today, because uh, uh, I hope that these issues are going to be interesting. At least I'm going to try to make uh, uh, as informative as possible my 20 minutes. Uh, maybe starting with uh, a few sentences on on Eurofound and and uh, uh, the particular survey. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Barry Eurofound is the only EU agency which is based in Ireland, uh, but this is also the oldest EU agency. So it has been founded back in 1975, and for all these uh, 47 years now. Uh, we are studying, uh, we are making research on employment, working conditions, uh, social policies, balance between working and, uh, and uh, private life. Uh, and this research appears uh, as relevant today as it has been 47 years ago. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, lots of our research is taken by our stakeholders. So we are a tripartite agency, which means that we are governed by uh, the governments, uh, employers, and workers uh, from all EU member states. Uh, so uh, we are providing research. We have about uh, 30 to 40 publications per year. We have all the, at any time 50 subjects uh, under research in the pipeline. Uh, and we are very happy that uh, lots of our research pop up in different other academic uh, uh, editions or in policy documents uh, or in different uh, uh, in different parts where our stakeholders are taking them. Uh, this particular uh, survey that uh, I'm going to present uh, is something we started at the beginning of the lockdown. So it was uh, spring, uh, actually April 2020. When the lockdown started, when the economy started closing down, and when we wanted to see what happens and what is the effect on working and on, on living and, and how people feel with this uh, huge stress that we had at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. So my colleagues uh, then started an e-based uh, survey based on the on the social media, but uh, in every member state we are very selective in terms of gender, age groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we don't call it representative because uh, certainly we don't reach people and groups that are not using social media. But so far we have uh, uh, more than two hundred thousand uh, uh, answers and replies. So 
I would say this is very, very uh, realistic and very good information that, uh, that could be used. I think we are the only ones in the EU that have started back two years back, and uh, we have already the fifth wave of this uh, uh, survey uh, going uh, uh, on the uh, train and asking people about their opinions. Uh, many of these people uh, keep responding every six months to us, so we, we can see uh, a little bit also the trends of what is happening in the working and living conditions. And this fifth uh, uh, survey that uh, was just published, you can find it on our webpage, uh, shows very interesting trends. Uh, so I'll try to take uh, the flavor of these trends. I mean, the most interesting, the most uh, important things to take home. Uh, but uh, if you go into the figures, uh, this is going to give you much more information. Uh, uh, trying to uh, make it uh, more informative, I'm going to use uh, slides and uh, graphs. I think visually they sometimes present better than words what, uh, what we are doing, but again, you're very welcome to, uh, to go to the EUFOUNDS uh, website and, and, uh, and see more details on that. So if we can start the, uh, the presentation with, uh, with the first slide, uh, uh, and uh, next one, please. I mean, the first uh, graph we have, uh, this is a graph showing uh, the, the, how many people lost their jobs during the lockdowns and the pandemic. So you see, we have three stop points, spring 2020, 2021, and 2022. By the way, uh, in between, in the autumn of 2020 and 2021, we also had surveys. So we practically have fifth, uh, fifth surveys, that, five surveys that, uh, that uh, go on that. So what we see is that in terms of uh, uh, job retention, uh, the situation is extremely different in the different EU member countries. Uh, you're going to see the, 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 the usual uh, suspected countries like uh, Greece, Spain, Cyprus losing most of the jobs. And this was after one year of lockdown. Uh, on the other side of the graph, you have countries like Netherlands, Luxembourg that, uh, that lost a few of them. Uh, you can see that Ireland uh, is uh, uh, kind of uh, part of the first group of countries where uh, despite the measures that have been taken, uh, especially after the first year of the, of the lockdowns, uh, there were quite a lot of uh, job losses. So this is to tell you that the, 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 the situation in terms of job retention was very different in the different member states. Now, next slide, please. Uh, here we see uh, what is the location of work across the three survey rounds, uh, uh, where people work from home, entirely from the office or the workplace entirely or a hybrid working. Uh, if uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, speaking before this survey, I would say that uh, uh, teleworking is here to stay and I'm still confident in that. Uh, uh, the, because uh, you have uh, very clear signs of interest from the workers, from the employers and from the governments uh, that uh, uh, teleworking or hybrid working, which is uh, uh, combining working from the office with uh, working from, uh, from, uh, from distance remotely uh, uh, is going to stay. Everybody wants this, everybody likes this. Uh, at the same time, there are some uh, drawbacks. One of them is uh, uh, the hassle it creates mostly to the management. So what we see now in the last uh, survey is that many of the employers are asking uh, the workers to go back to the office when the, the lockdown ends. Still, we have a substantially higher percentage of people working from, uh, from other places remotely uh, compared to the pre-COVID situation where we had three to 5% of the workers. Now we have about 30% of the workers working either entirely remotely or in a hybrid way. But this is still much less than the potential and we see a trend of decreasing. So uh, now we have this uh, uh, movement back of the, uh, uh, of the pendulum uh, but I'm sure, again, that's a, a subject that I could elaborate lots, that uh, teleworking is uh, already here to stay, and this is uh, creating privileged jobs. I mean, you are going to see, especially young people that particularly prefer to have uh, teleworking. Next slide, please. And we are going to see uh, the preferences. Here you see the preferences for teleworking uh, daily or, or several times a, a day or a month at least. Uh, by the different age groups. So you're going to see that women are much more likely to ask for teleworking and uh, young people 
uh, uh, but above 30, I mean, not the youngest. Uh, and this is increasing with, uh, with the age, also required to work uh, remotely. Uh, it is uh, very important to say that the young, the starters of the, of the work would prefer to go to the office and you have good explanations for that because they would like to uh, to be in the, to feel the atmosphere of the company. I mean, to see where they are, how they're uh, getting uh, uh, on board of the company, et cetera, et cetera. So they would prefer to, prefer to be there because of these particular reasons. Uh, but otherwise, uh, people would tend much more than the actual practice to work uh, remotely or uh, in a hybrid way. For women, this is a particularly important uh, issue because uh, uh, this is a way we have proven they have uh, much better opportunities to combine their private life with the working life. So the message here is teleworking is uh, still high indeed it's decreasing but the demand is higher and the pressure to the uh, to the employers to keep it uh, a high percentage is going to be there of course there are a number of issues with overtime right to disconnect etc cetera, etc cetera, that needs to be solved next slide slide please uh, here we see uh, different uh, other effects of the pandemic. Uh, then the, I would focus in particular on the health effects, on, on the mental health effect, effect, because we have seen that uh, during the pandemic uh, we have that we had much increasing problems with mental health uh, that were not met. Uh, so you see uh, the negative feelings and risk of depression by uh, by age. Uh, in the three uh, in the three consecutive uh, surveys, this covers again the two years. Uh, we see that uh, uh, basically young people uh, suffer much more from uh, uh, mental health problems, insecurity, uh, loss of perspective, uh, uh, loss of, uh, of feeling that uh, they can have a useful work, uh, more depression, more loneliness, uh, more tense. Uh, a state than, than elderly people. So uh, this is something which I think needs to be taken on board. And in particular, if we see the next slide, uh, please, uh, we are going to see that uh, uh, many of, this, uh, uh, of these issues are not taken on board. Here we have, uh, 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 before, before we go to the next slide, just to, to show you here the uh, I said young people are much more of the subject of, of mental uh, health problems, uh, but uh, in terms of gender, these are more uh, women. Uh, not surprisingly, the unemployed people, the people with disabilities, those that have uh, difficulties to have a permanent and more stable job, uh, have much higher levels of, uh, of, uh, of uh, depression and, and, uh, and anxiety. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, how uh, the healthcare meets these needs. And we see that uh, practically, despite the fact that there is an improvement of the healthcare services that are provided, uh, this is not for only for mental health, mental health for, but for all health needs, uh, still uh, it is, there is a very high percentage, especially in some member states, uh, of uh, unmet health needs by the by the medical system by the, by the by the health system and also this is a very serious issue that uh, that needs to be addressed uh, again if you look at the case of Ireland again there is an improvement uh, for uh, for one year uh, but still there is a too high percent percentage of unmet uh, medical uh, medical needs next slide please uh, this is what type of medical needs we uh, we are talking about and this is the hospital specialist care which is uh, clearly uh, the the leading one uh, but uh, i would uh, also point uh, in particular the preventive screening or test because the prevention if the prevention suffers then we create a number of additional problems afterwards and it is much more expensive for the society to deal with the problems and I would also point to the mental health care. I mean, what I uh, also mentioned, because we have seen a tremendously increased levels of stress during the lockdowns and during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, the mental health need, uh, needs are still very high and the unmet needs are still very high, again, despite a slight improvement. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, the situation by age uh, in mental health, and uh, we, are, we, we see that uh, the, the, the most serious situation is with young people, 18 to 24. These are the people that are 
either students or entering the job market with all the insecurities. And uh, uh, you can imagine that if they have a difficult start, then it's going to take time uh, for many of them to, to, to go to the normal, uh, um, to the normal uh, way and mainstream of uh, the working conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, here, uh, we focus on the ability to make ends, uh, ends meet. So uh, what are the difficulties uh, to, to, to pay the, the family budget uh, for the families? Uh, so what we see is that we have a deterioration on this, uh, uh, on this parameter as well, uh, which means uh, there are much less families that uh, are at ease with their budgets and they can uh, guarantee their uh, monthly uh, payments and we have an increased uncertainty of people with great difficulty or with at least with difficulty uh, that are paying their, their monthly bills. bills. This is also very important because this reflects also uh, their readiness and capability to work properly, uh, their quality of work, their quality of life uh, and uh, as we are going to see also very much uh, uh, their uh, trust in the society and in the institutions and eventually some additional problems uh, that, uh, that could happen. So this uh, process, of course, this is very much uh, strengthened and, and reinforced by the war in Ukraine. I mean, if we ask now, I mean, this is uh, the situation in the spring. Uh, uh, I'm afraid this is going to be even worse with the raising prices and the raising inflation. Uh, and this is indeed a very serious problem that needs to be addressed by, by policymakers. Next slide, please. Uh, now we go to another issue, which is uh, related to the trust in institutions. We started asking this uh, question uh, when uh, we were asking, do you trust governments or doctors or science, when uh, the idea was to, to, to speak about vaccination and the, uh, the opposition eventually of the, uh, of the vaccination. And this is what we see. We have a general trend of decreasing confidence, especially after uh, uh, in the last uh, one year. I mean, in the first year, you see there was uh, a little bit of uh, improvement of the, of the confidence in the European Union, uh, which is due very much to the active position of the outset of the, uh, of the COVID crisis of the EU institutions with the SURE program, with the support for the uh, for the jobs uh, and the retention of jobs uh, with uh, the common actions uh, providing vaccines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but then in the last year, uh, like for the other institutions, uh, uh, the, this uh, trust starts uh, uh, decreasing. Uh, and uh, we see uh, in general the highest trust in the health is in the healthcare system, uh, but also the trust in the healthcare system goes down. I mean, this whole situation with people having more difficulties uh, to, to, with their budgets, having more stress at work and, and the possibility to resume the normal uh, pace of work uh, is very much reflected in the, uh, in the confidence levels. So uh, the question here is uh, who would be uh, the, uh, the trusted source of information and, and communication with the public? Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, a, a graph which is not going to, uh, to surprise you. Uh, this is the uh, trust in uh, national governments by ability of, uh, uh, of the people to make the ends meet. And uh, not surprisingly, again, the most difficulties you have in your family, the less you trust anybody. Uh, authorities, uh, uh, doctors, uh, media, anybody who is part of the of the of the establishment, uh, the trust levels increase with uh, uh, increasing incomes. Uh, but uh, what we see is that uh, uh, there is also a general trend that we have seen also in the previous uh, graph of decreasing uh, whatever the initial level at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, now there is a trend of decreasing uh, the trust in the institutions. And that can bring us uh, some additional problems that, uh, that we need to, to, to foresee. Next slide, the slide, please. Yes, again, this is the breakdown by uh, in trust uh, uh, towards different, uh, uh, the different sources of information. Uh, as we see, uh, uh, doctors, uh, healthcare, uh, science uh, are among the highest ones. 
Uh, then we have uh, police, we have the news uh, uh, and media. Uh, but uh, what is very surprising here, look what is the uh, very low trust uh, in the institutions uh, of the people that have the main source of information uh, from the social media. And I'm going to touch on this uh, in a while. Uh, because there are more and more people that are collecting information from social media. media. So uh, here you see the more you tap information from social media, the less you trust uh, anybody, any part of, I mean, not only the institutions, but also uh, police, healthcare, doctors, etc., etc. Very much this is explained with fake news, with echo chambers that are created online, etc., etc. Next slide, please. Thanks a lot. This is a, a particular zoom on Ireland and the situation in Ireland. Uh, what we can say is that you have more or less the similar trends like uh, uh, in the other countries and in, in Europe as, uh, as average. Uh, but what is characteristic for Ireland is that you have highest, higher levels of trust to government, institutions, and the EU compared to other countries. So Ireland stays even uh, at one point, it states the first among all EU 27 member states in terms of trust in national government and uh, EU institutions. This was again in the first year of the pandemic when all these uh, measures for job retention and for vaccination and prevention from, from contacts were, were deployed. Uh, but again, you have the same trend of decreasing trust. Uh, still, you have uh, a higher trust compared to the EU 27 that, uh, that you see on this graph. Next graph, please. Um, here is something that I would like just to point your attention on this, because I think this is a, a, a precursor for a huge, I would say, tectonic uh, societal changes. Uh, so uh, this is the political participation by vaccination status. Uh, you're going to say this is very strange. I mean, who asks uh, whether you are vaccinated or non-vaccinated and uh, uh, what is your political participation? What we see is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, and this is when we ask the questions about trust. Uh, those that have low trust in the institutions become more and more motivated and politically active. Uh, so, uh, and uh, on the uh, on the ground of the general resignation of the of the voters and the and the civil society uh, that uh, has a decreasing trust, uh, they're fighting with problems, uh, meeting now the effects of the war in Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have uh, the people that were against the vaccination. Many of them, by the way, are very much supportive of the Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, whatever you, you put there, these are people that are against the establishment. And these people are very active. And by the way, if you uh, look uh, across Europe at the, at the elections, you're going to see a rise of nationalistic, uh, some extreme or some mainstream, but not establishment-based parties. Uh, and, and, and this is a very clear and, and very obvious trend there. So, you have a motivation and activization of people that don't trust anybody and that these people uh, base their information and their motivation on the social media uh, and on the different uh, on the different social media and uh, if i were to take decisions about uh, about political processes i would uh, watch very carefully this uh, this uh, group of people some of them are absolutely uh, misled by false information uh, uh, by, by disinformation, some of them find a way to fight against the, the establishment and uh, they, the first step is to go very actively to elections and, uh, and uh, have sometimes very, uh, very strange, uh, unexpected results. I mean, not to mention Brexit referendum, uh, the Trump elections in the, in the, in the U US, uh, or I could give many other examples across, uh, across Europe. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, this was the last one. So this is uh, a, a very quick. I mean, trying to squeeze into the time overview of the findings again, uh, how people feel and how people uh, react to the crisis two years after the beginning of the lockdowns. And by the way, we see that there is an increased wave. So we are going to see how uh, how we we would react uh, uh, towards the end of, uh, of this year. 
These are processes. What we show, this is not a picture, but this is a process. And this process uh, uh, is developing. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, that uh, these issues have to be taken very seriously into consideration. And I would mention once again, the need to assure more conditions and better uh, provisions for teleworking, for remote working, special attention to women and to very young people, special attention to mental health, which is, uh, which is a problem, but health as a, uh, as a whole, uh, and uh, uh, watching uh, these developments that, uh, happen, uh, that happen in the society with the decreasing trust in institutions, and active motivation to vote anti-establishment very very much fueled by the by the social media thank you very much Barry.